Welcome to Slash Forward, where we always wonder which is worse, mutants or zombies or vampires. We'll examine all three in the 1980 Italian trash classic, Nightmare City. Comment with your thoughts on how to best classify what these things are, and consider subscribing to the channel to continue your research. Let's get to it. We open, as in any Italian film, on some jazzy-ass music over scenes of the big city. Just so you get a sense of the setting of the film, you know? And then, news exposition about a nuclear spill that luckily follows Dean Miller all the way to his meeting, keeping both him and us apprised of the situation. He's a journalist, you see, and he's been given the task of meeting with a high official at the airport to acquire some additional details. He and his cameraman arrive early because he's a stone-cold professional, and via his experience, he has a sense that something is off here. We get confirmation of this in the control tower as they notice an unscheduled scheduled aircraft flying in low and hard from the northeast. Turns out, it's an unmarked military transport, so they open up a lane and let it land. No problem at all. It eventually touches down about five miles away, and by the time the authorities arrive, it appears to be unpiloted. All this commotion and fanfare is enough to get Miller hard as a rock, so they run out to bear witness to these potentially historic events. The police surround the fuselage and command its occupants to come out. Professor Hagenbach, the man Miller was there to interview, emerges. While this seems convenient, the rest of the occupants pour out and immediately begin slaughtering all the looky loos and using them to fulfill their insatiable thirst for blood. So, not that convenient. These mutants seem to be impervious to physical pain, and their travails are recorded for posterity by Miller and his cameraman. But as the violence continues to spill out in waves, Dean makes the call to go ahead and pull back and retreat. A wise choice, as in the aftermath, we see that no one was spared. In town, they're too busy creating content for the local station, fulfilling the population's basis desires to heed any warnings of the big happenings going down at the airport. So as these dancers are recorded by the medical personnel that apparently run the station, Miller returns to commandeer the airwaves and let the news be heard. He claims autonomy over the station. Am I in charge of the broadcast or not? Enforces his report through all frequencies. As Dean gets caught up in having his moment, the chief gives him some major blue balls by cutting the signal so they can discuss this first. And in the meantime, we dance. As Miller goes to tell the chief to never interrupt him when he's in the middle of expositing, we find General Murchison was at the station already and declines to uphold its high ethical standards of journalism in order to keep the city calm as they work through their investigation. Dean leans heavily on his right to disseminate information, but Murchison leans heavily on the chief threatening personal punishment for allowing the news to run, a poignant encapsulation of the danger of for-profit news. In the aftermath of this conversation, Miller is both fired and quits. Then he snatches a phone from a former co-worker so he can call home. Unfortunately, he only catches his housekeeper, who tries to run out and catch his wife Anna, but misses her, as she's now heading into work at the hospital. And his mission is now clear. Meanwhile, somewhere, and for some reason, an artist prepares to make love to her elderly muse. She sees God in the delicate folds of his neck flaps, but they are unfortunately interrupted by the phone, the call of which Major Holmes is unable to ignore. He's just too important and serious of a man, and sure enough, he discovers he's been called in for a consultation regarding the airport situation. And then again we dance, and spread, and dance, and the men are so busy gazing upon this performance that they barely notice that Tina's failed to hit her mark. Then her assailant emerges and stabs to the beat. However, when his friends join in, party time is over as the dance escalates into a slaughter, the natural next level when discussing magnitudes of frenzy. Miller sees this happening and closes several of them into the studio before immediately getting on the phone with civil defense to make sure they're apprised of the situation. He then chucks an exploding monitor and ducks out under cover of electrical fire. In the hall, most paths are blocked, but he's agile enough to slip into the service elevator and find his way out. He then cuts through the bedlam to an available car and then tears through the landscaping like he's in the Italian job. Meanwhile, Anna's making the rounds at the hospital where things are still quiet. At the command center, we find the civil defense crew trying to get their arms around this, but the reports coming in are sketchy and erratic. One advantage, they roll in a sample mutant to confirm they aren't aliens, just highly radioactive humans blessed with hyper-regeneration. Donahue then confirms that there is some transfer of material from assailant to victim, that they're driven by a constant need to try to replenish their depleted red blood cell count, and that headshots are ideal, a real mishmash of mythologies, but updated for the 20th century. Holmes steps away to interrupt Sheila's glow-up. I, uh, 
want to look nice for you this evening. Yeah, and instructs her to secure the home and answer to no one. She runs outside to find the gardener derelict in his duties before locking herself in. She then runs upstairs to discover her masterpiece has been defaced with a bloody knife. But we don't have time for that. Dean is urgently attempting to reach his wife. Unfortunately, she's busy in the OR and can't be disturbed, so he takes his frustration out on a pedestrian. And since all good movies have innumerable narrative threads, we then meet up with Jessica Murchison, the general's daughter. She's been summoned to meet up with her father for her own protection. However, when she calls to confirm this with him, the line goes dead. Luckily, her husband convinces her they should sneak out so they don't miss the day trip to the countryside they had already planned. This decision allows them to narrowly and unwittingly escape harm, as their transport is slaughtered as they leave. It's dark when Dean finally makes it to the hospital and Anna is still tied up, requiring him to wait it out. Meanwhile, at a nearby military base, everyone's going about their normal business when Whitey starts acting strange or stranger. Here we witness our first victim turned mutant zombie vampire, who's brought in a Trojan horse of fellow mutants who descend upon the soldiers, quickly overtake the base, and then shut down the power grid. Back at the command post, civil defense is still playing with their models, and in their benevolence, deem it still necessary to keep the public in the dark, so as to prevent any major catastrophes from unfolding via panic. The result of this is a hospital staff oblivious to the danger as the bodies finally start to arrive. Fully understanding what this signals, Dean begins to head to the OR. Luckily, Anna had to dip out for medical supplies. While fulfilling her list, she discovers that she's not alone. But it's okay, because in this case, the mutants she runs across are really more about creating tension and high drama, which allows her a chance to run off where she eventually meets up with Dean. She tells him what she saw, but he already knows all that. So they try to find a way out as the OR is overtaken and the boys start sucking on that good stuff. Downstairs, the Millers find a quiet place to hide out and wait. They listen to everyone else getting killed, and things start to die down a bit as the carnage spills outside. When the coast seems clear, they slip out and manage to escape in an ambulance. The next morning, we see Holmes buzzing the city in his helicopter, keeping an eye on things as they drive through the wasteland. At command, we learn that all communications are cut, so they have no choice but to call in a state of emergency and begin prepping the bombers at the nearby airfield. The Millers hear about the lockdown and take a few moments of their drive to philosophize about the consequences of man's interference in nature, which brings them no solutions whatsoever. Out in a field by the road, Jessica and Bob hear the news and debate whether to find protection or continue their vacation. They ultimately decide to wait on their friends to arrive to fill them in on what's going on in the city. Jessica is startled by a nearby corpse, but happy to see their friends have arrived. But she quickly grows unhappy to see them as they have arrived as mutants and waste no time at all gunning them down and sucking them dry. Back at the Holmes residence, Sheila's gotten over the vandalism of her favorite bust and is focused on rebuilding her masterpiece, but she's drawn downstairs by the frantic knocking of her friend Cindy. She's spooked out and neither of them have a good idea of what's going on. When Cindy mentions having barricaded her cellar, Sheila realizes she missed that entry point, so they both head downstairs to secure it. While there, they hear a bump, which Sheila goes off to explore on her own. She finds an open door, but the danger is downstairs with Cindy, who suffers the slow insertion of a large spike just below her breast and then into her eyeball. Meanwhile, the Millers are still driving, but are eventually forced to pull over for gas. Dean looks for an attendant and wipes his fingers across a bloody axe. Since he can't find the blood sack it came from, he gives the all clear. With society now fallen, they help themselves to whatever they'd like, enjoying a minor shopping spree capped off with some coffee. Having now sufficiently dipped their toes in that water, Dean then goes to fuel up while Anna stays behind to rob the store blind. But she's interrupted by a mutant. Dean rushes in so they can barricade themselves inside, and they soon find the ambulance is no longer viable. He immediately flashes back to his old revolutionary days and sets to creating a Molotov cocktail as their enemies begin to gather up around the pump. His plan works well. Now on foot, they rush out into a field where Anna begins to lose all hope. But Dean's stoicism and thirst for violence carries them through. As they work through these troubles, Holmes continues to zip around as the mutants playfully race the helicopter. Seeing they've all grouped up, he calls in an airstrike. While he waits on that, the Millers arrive at a quiet church, but proceed with caution. If they're really vampires, they can't enter the house of God. But are they? They find the father, who they seem to not realize is a mutant, until we, the audience, see it as well. And Dean lets him know that Jesus compels him to get his wig split. Still waiting on that airstrike, Holmes decides to go check in and finds the airfield full of fueled and armed planes, but no pilots in sight. He notifies command of this development and is called back to home base. 
Along the way, he stops off at his villa to pick up Sheila. Unfortunately, he arrives to bear witness to the consequence of the prior altercation and is forced to shoot her damn head off. The Millers eventually stumble upon an abandoned amusement park, which seems fun. But then they discover a Jeep they could use for their escape and decide to do that instead. As Dean checks it out, he's forced to practice his sharpshooting skills on Anna's face, and then they're overtaken and forced to abandon this plan. Dean, however, does manage to pick up firearms from the fallen soldiers and sprays down any who step to him, exploding fools' heads left and right. They proceed up a secret path while chucking grenades for cover, and what seemed foolishly hopeless turns out to be the best decision they could ever make, as Holmes, now despondent, is listlessly wandering about the city and happens to fly in their general direction at that exact moment, so he pulls up and goes fishing for survivors. Unfortunately, and despite their best encouragement and knots in the rope, Anna does fail her fifth grade fitness test, allowing herself to be overcome with a swooning fit and plunging to the earth below. Dean then wakes up late for work. You see, he's on his way to the airport to interview a Professor Hagenbach. He arrives apparently oblivious to the dream deja vu, resulting in events unfolding in a manner familiar to us, but that he seems destined to reenact. And oh man, they got us on this one you guys. I have a website set up where you can support the channel through donations or merch. I'd like to take a moment to give a huge thanks to my donors memorialized in the Hall of Headshots. My vote is that these things were just mutants. The zombie and vampire aspects were secondary factors to the nature of their mutation. Nightmare City is one of those kinds of movies, a classic in 80s Italian horror cheese. It struggles to find a narrative but fills it in with extended scenes of gore and gratuitous nudity. All of this is hung on a framework of actors putting in an earnest performance of a ridiculous situation, a cornerstone for making an entertaining film. If you enjoyed the video, I'd love for you to become a part of the channel by subscribing. Thanks for watching.